Welcome back to the MBA on Microsoft Blockchain as a Service. We're going to draw out some actual architectures here now uh, to kind of correlate with some of the lecture that we've given you earlier. Let's do it on our handy Surface Hub here. Yeah, so the first one I thought we'd draw out is we talked a little bit, Derek, about keys. Yep. And we talked that keys were very important to the blockchain and how we leverage keys. There's Actually, I see it as kind of two different kind of models for how we would do keys. So if we talk about... Um, Basically, let's call this the fully decentralized. Don't misspell it. Yeah. There we go. And then we'll talk about over here, maybe this is more centralized, traditional. Okay. Pardon my writing with my finger, but basically what, what we would do here is we're thinking about, um, you can think about it as this is the client and this is the server. So in this case, whether this is a mobile phone or whether this is an actual like a PC, um, doesn't really matter. Could it also be a human? Could be, but uh, what I'm thinking about is where the actual keys sit. Oh, okay. The so, device itself. Okay. Exactly. So, I mentioned before that uh, some of the folks in our, our partner solutions with like Uport are actually looking at this exact model right here. So, basically being able to use the secure enclave inside of a mobile device to actually hold your keys. Now, you might ask why would I want to go through all that trouble? I mean, writing to hardware seems very specific to a vendor seems like it'd be a lot of work. Why not just put it in software? Right. And one of the big drawbacks there is OSs have vulnerabilities. Sure. It's a piece of software. Right. Uh, hardware chips are less of such because they're more simpler devices. We can kind of harden them a bit more right. um, and provide that increased security. So this could be a TPM device. It could be the, uh, the device we were talking about earlier. Yeah, we're even, uh, look, uh, you know, there's a bunch of vendors out there. You can go look at them, USB. Like an HSM module. Exactly. So they provide a little enclave there inside the actual hardware unit of a USB key. You could plug that thing in and then leverage that. Okay. So in this model, basically in our DAP, um, our DAP would, up here would be our blockchain. And we'll just represent that with a series of nodes here that are all connected. And we won't do full mesh here, but you, you get the idea. So here's our blockchain. And basically our DAP would have a client side. So maybe this is in JavaScript, for instance. And then we would have a server side okay. um, that's actually going to talk to the blockchain. This may talk directly through our DAP, through JavaScript, out directly into the blockchain. Or we may have like a server component here, like an API or something that we're mm -hmm. going to talk to. And so in that model, it would just go to the API and we could do proxying there. Right. But the point is, we don't have to focus so much on securing this whole network, right? So this may be going over the internet. Sure. And in traditional sense right now, what do we do? SSL, because we're worried about somebody at man in the middle looking at what's going on in there. If you think about it, there's less impact here if you're actually signing data on the client. Because the data itself that you wanted to protect is already encrypted over here. Right. It before never it leaves, leaves that enclave. Yeah. And when, and when it does leave, it's already encrypted. Right. So the transport layer doesn't matter as much anymore. So I was always worried when we initially got started on this, I kept saying, hey, Kale, I'd, how can this be secure because it's talking over just plain old HTTP with, you know, RPC calls. But because it's already encrypted at the device itself, it's less of a concern that you also add the overlay of TLS and, and HTTPS on top of that. Right. Okay. So what about the centralized model? Yeah, in the centralized model, again, we're going to have our client and our server here, right? And so on the client side here, again, we're going to have devices. So let's say it is a phone and, and we'll do our laptop again. That looks really bad, but that's okay. Uh, and basically up here, we could leverage stuff like, and, and you had mentioned this earlier, maybe something like Azure Key Vault, mm -hmm. right? And then again, we have our blockchain over here. I'll just do it really quickly. So we have our blockchain there, and essentially we're going to make calls. Now again, we're going to have to secure the tunnel to get up to our service over right. here. And that's going to be SSL. Correct. And then we may have an API or something here that's wrapping this, so we're not maybe talking directly to Key Vault. Right. Generally a good, from a DevOps perspective, that's going to be a good idea anyway. Right. So we could basically have this thing proxy the calls to go get this. Now, what's cool about that is the keys don't have to leave the key vault. Right. Right. So if we keep the keys over here, so the keys are actually sitting inside of here, we're actually making calls from our API, which is all on the server side, to go say, hey, go sign this data for me. Now, the problem is the data was in the clear here, and that's why we have SSL. Right. And so what you're doing is you may gain some benefits of latency. You may gain some additional security enhancements by the fact that you can abstract this away from the client device itself. And But you also have the ability to, to make these devices 
like uh, the phone or the PC be uh, not instrumental in protecting the key, the hardware key itself. Correct. So it becomes a, this more, more utilitarian, whereas over here in the decentralized space, you lose the device, you're in trouble. Yeah, and I think the other thing you could do here, this is more of a retrofit kind of thing. So you can think about this, this we already have apps out on these, so we may have an iOS app or a mm -hmm. Windows Phone app. We may have some apps out on our PC. They don't necessarily need to even know about blockchain in this case. Right. right? They're just talking to an API or a, an MPC app or something over there, and this thing's handling all that complexity for us on the server side. Yeah, so you can see how there are some downsides and some uh, benefits to both approaches. Uh, it really depends on how you want to uh, architect your app and your solution. So real quick, let's also talk about gas. And we alluded to this uh, in the uh, other sessions, uh, but uh, can you tell me a little bit about how gas works, why you need it, how you execute on it, what does that look like architecturally? Yeah, so basically if we took a little diagram here and we said, okay, we have a, we have a user over here who's gonna interact, he's got some keys, right? So he's gonna do a signing over here. And then over here, we have our blockchain. We're gonna get really good at drawing blockchains here, but. I was thinking getting good at drawing circles, but that's, that's another <laughs> thing. Yeah, so here's our blockchain, here's our, here's our end user. And essentially what's going to happen is we have a contract that lives up here, right? Yep. So this guy already got uploaded by, by some admin at some point, may have been a user, may have not. And this has a bunch of lines of codes in it, and maybe it has like three different methods, mm -hmm. um, which have varying levels of compute and storage that they're actually going right. to be doing. So when this guy signs a transaction, so we have our trans right here. And we have an address, 0x. Correct. This sort of address. So this guy will be referenced in here, that 0x address. Just call it 111 or something. And then he's also going to pack along the params. Mm -hmm. Now what's actually happening the flow-wise is he's going to submit this transaction. That transaction is going to go up here. And obviously, again, it piles up in a queue. And these are what construct a block. So each of these transactions, you'd have a block at this layer. Right. So these transactions are piling up here. Eventually, we say, okay, we've got enough transactions. We can write a block. Uh, at that point, it's going to recognize that maybe this was T1, okay? So he's sitting in here. This guy may say, hey, I actually need to operate on this guy. Here's my parameters. Here's my uh, address for where I want to execute it. Mm -hmm. The first thing that's going to happen is it's going to validate those parameters. It's going to do type checks. It's going to make sure you got the right parameters that you passed over. If you don't, it gets rejected. So the whole transaction will get rejected. Correct. Okay. And uh, back to the other thing. This is asynchronous, remember, because we submitted that. So you're going to have to check back in at that transaction and see did that thing complete, okay. and you're going to get that re error response that uh, you know about the parameters are incorrect. Or okay. I don't know the exact one off the top. It's of not hand. at runtime; it's at block time. Correct. Correct. That's really, really important to understand Correct. here. Okay. Now you've already compiled the smart contract, so you know it's sound. Right. But now it's somebody calling it. Right. right? So once that comes through, then we basically, uh, when it's time to actually process this block, each one of these guys, like we said before, is going to go execute this thing. Now, when they execute it, there's a, there's a gas that's involved. So, basically, you can add more gas, but by default, what it's going to do is look at, um, you know, there might be, and I'm trying to write some pseudocode here with my finger, which is really hard. They have these pens here. They're really cool. Yeah. And then you'll have, like, functions, you know, and, and it's just typical JavaScript, and you'll have some lines of code in there. All right. But, basically, each one of these maps to an opcode. If you think about assembly language with C++ or even MSIL and how that gets mm -hmm. compiled down when it gets run at machine code, this is the same concept, essentially. So we're basically like boiling this down and saying, here's the opcodes it takes to run this thing. And then it's going to, basically it has a mapping table that says, this means whatever, 0.3 something in the gas or whatnot. So and they have weights. And, in, and just for a terminology perspective, in Ethereum, gas is calculated in what unit of measure? Ether. In Ether. Yeah. Okay. What, Technically, it's actually in way. In but, way, yeah. okay. So it could be this really long zeros and then a couple of numbers at the end. It's a good point. Um, so one ether, and I don't know. Again, we could, could drop that in, but equals like um, this way calculation we keep calling, which is uh, essentially a universal currency measurement. Mm -hmm. So it's not tied directly to ether. Um, this is the calculation, but it's like Derek said, it'll be a really long number, it'll right. be like zero 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 one, you know, really long. Um, so when you start working with Ethereum, you'll notice that right away. You'll be like, you don't have enough gas. Right. And then you figure out that it was in way and you start playing right. around with that. And so just to tie that up, every function or method in your environment, in your contract, is going to have a corresponding opcode that automatically gets mapped to it. 
they calculate all of that up together to the contract level, mm -hmm. and then when you execute the contract or a function on the contract, it's going to require some amount of way to actually perform that operation Correct. across all of them. I don't have to multiply it. It's, it's that one unit for the entire network. Yeah, and the interesting thing that you can get into here, like at, at, if you looked at a single smart contract, this makes sense, right? It's like pretty straightforward. We add up the opcodes, we got it. But like we talked before, this will actually be a chain of smart contracts, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's all kinds of paths that could, could, could happen there. If we have static paths, we could figure it out right away and say, right. what is it? But if we say, what if there's stuff that's like a recursive loop? Right, I want to do it in here, yep. and it's calling back over here several times. It's dynamically calculating Correct. the way based on all the opcodes of each contract. So you could get it where it starts, and then it could run out of gas. And okay. you'll get an out of gas uh, error message when you see that kind of thing. And that's what you know what happened when you did that. Oh, maybe I'm actually calling some loop or Too something. Too much like happening. Okay, yeah. great. Well, that's a good, good overview, good architectural diagram of both key management and gas. I uh, hope you enjoyed this architectural drawing session. Talk soon.